we begin a word of thanks to all of you for coming this evening, parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters, and of course, extended family and friends. It's a, an honor and a joy as we gather and celebrate together today. We're so grateful that uh, we have uh, a, good, a good part of our parish clergy here uh, with us. Of course, Deacon Paul Walter represents all six of our deacons, and uh, so grateful that you are with us. Uh, Father Dan, who needs no introduction, the chaplain for the school, and uh, none of them need an introduction, of course. Closer to me, Father Rob Wozniak and, uh, and Father David Baker, who we only get part of him, you know, he's the vocation director for the diocese too, but, uh, but we, we hold on to as much of him as we can, and uh, for any of the young men who are graduating, he is more than willing to give you an application, right? <laughs> for the seminary. A joy to be together tonight. First reading, the book of Deuteronomy. What is it that we heard? Moses said to the people, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, and follow his ways exactly. To love and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. To keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I enjoin on you today for your own good. Think the heavens, even the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as well as the earth, and everything on it. And now, 2024 graduates of St. Gregory the Great School, what does the Lord your God ask of you? And the word really is not ask, it's require. Most scripture scholars will say the proper English term would be require. So what does the Lord your God require? Fear the Lord your God. Follow his ways exactly. Love and serve the Lord. Your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. To keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord which I enjoin on you today for your own good. Think, the heavens, even the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as well as the earth and everything on it. The word spoken by Moses thousands of years ago to the people of Israel are the exact same words that the Lord God is speaking to you, our graduates, tonight. The words, the message, have not changed in thousands of years. And now all of our parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, all of our teacher, our board of trustees, our staff, and yes, even our deacon and my brother priests. What does the Lord your God require of you? the exact same message. And so what does this mean for all of us, and really especially for our graduates at this very important key moment of your life? As we come and we celebrate and praise and thanks and we ask the Lord's blessing upon your future, we also ask that question, what does the Lord God require of you? Well, first, to fear the Lord. Now, hopefully, You've covered this well in scripture class. To fear the Lord does not mean that we're afraid of God. You know, kind of walking down the dark alley and we hear footsteps behind us. You know, a little fear is a pretty good thing at that moment. But to fear the Lord really means to honor, to revere, to be in awe of God. First thing that we're reminded very clearly for all of us that the Lord requires, he requires is that we fear him, we live in awe of God. Second, 
We're to follow his ways exactly. It's a very important term, exactly. We're to follow his, his ways exactly. And that's very key and very important for us all because particularly in our modern way of living, we make all kinds of little exceptions. And we sometimes do not exactly follow the way of the Lord. And very often we take it for granted, well, God will understand I just have to be this way right now. Follow his ways exactly. Number three, love the Lord. That's very important. And what does it really mean to love the Lord? It means that we think of God throughout the day. Ideally, we wake up thinking about the Lord. And just as a a good married couple, and after 32 years of of ordained life, I've seen wonderful married couples, I do not need to tell a good, healthy, married couple to love one another. I don't need to do that. I don't need to remind them. Why? Because they would think of doing nothing else but really sacrificing their lives and to utilizing all of what they have and are for each other. Love the Lord the same way. Number four ties right to it. Serve the Lord with all your heart and soul. Meaning all of those talents and abilities, I mentioned them at the beginning of Mass, That's what you bring to the altar today. So many of them you've developed so beautifully here at St. Gregory the Great. Use all those talents and abilities. Use your future, your careers, your vocation, your way of life to serve the Lord. And as I have said many a time, God is rather selfish. God is selfish. Why do I say that? Because he wants all of your heart, all of your soul. He wants all of you and me, not just a part, not just a sliver. He wants all of us because that's how much he profoundly loves you and me. Number five, we're reminded to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. And it's very important to reflect on those Ten Commandments, the various teachings of Jesus, the virtues, the values of the gospel. I know one of our good parishioners who passed away a number of years ago. Very successful in business. He was president of one of our local banks. He was a graduate of Bonaventure University. And as a Canisius graduate, that's high praise to speak as someone who graduated from Bonas. You know, the little three. Uh, We still get after each other a little. And he was known always to have a little card in front of him on the desk or boardroom table, no matter what meeting he was at, he had this little card that had all of the Franciscan values. And if you ever sat at a meeting with him, he always constantly looked down at that card and was reading that card to be reminded, in all of these decisions we are making right now, I must keep the statutes and the commandments of the Lord. Very important. Number six, remember that you belong to the Lord. And that's very important to belong. You know, we, we like when we have our little circle of friends and we know how wonderful it feels, but we also know what it means when we're excluded, when we're left out. We probably even know that because it's painful and we remember that all the more. Remember you're never excluded from the Lord. You belong to him. He created you in his image and likeness. Remember the gospel passage where they're trying to trip Jesus up and they are saying, well, is it lawful to pay the census tax or not? And Jesus knew they were trying to trip him up and he said, well, show me the coin you used to pay the tax. Handed him the coin. Whose picture is this? Caesar. Well, if that's Caesar's, it must belong to him. Give it back to him. But give to God what belongs to God. Jesus reminded us, you belong to God. You're created in his image and likeness. Always remember that. Number seven, remain serious and sober. The second reading now, serious and sober so you will be able to pray. 
Hopefully it's saying, Greg's over all these years, we've taught you to pray. We begin and end every day in prayer, but hopefully that's not the beginning and end of our prayer life, but just a small part of it. That each and every day, each one of us pray. And so often I run into individuals who are really in a crisis, in a crisis, and they can appear almost be without any hope. And as I talk with them, I, I learn that they, they don't pray regularly, they don't pray daily, and, and so they don't even know how to turn to the Lord in that time of need. Similarly, we had just here night, last night a beautiful session with our young adults, and one of our parishioners gave a beautiful talk who's had several major crosses to carry in her life. And she was radiant in smiles. And why? She begins her day at 4 a.m. in the Adoration Chapel and is there until 7 o'clock, three hours, every day, and is here for 7 a.m. Mass. Second row, my left. Pray. Number eight, love one another because love covers a multitude of sin. Unfortunately, as we focus on social media, so often we see the reverse of love. We see hate and we see all kinds of difficult messages. But if we really remain in the Lord and we know we belong to the Lord, well, then we're going to abide in that love. And it is the power of love that causes us to forgive one another. If we genuinely love, we will genuinely forgive. Jesus genuinely loved on that cross and so has genuinely forgiven you and forgiven me. Love so you can forgive. Number nine, be hospitable to one another without complaining. So often we are so busy in our lives that we forget the lives of others. And we can be so busy rushing about, we, we miss the many, many opportunities in our life to be hospitable and to simply do the right thing. And in so doing, it'll change our lives. Story that I do not believe I've told you over these 11 years at St. Greg's. It was a Sunday. I was in my second assignment at St. Amelia's in the late 1990s. And uh, I had a couple of the morning masses and I needed that afternoon to get ready for Life Team, for our program and for the mass. But one of the parishioners on the way out, visibly upset, she said, Father, one of my friends, her son, Paul, is dying would you be willing to go to their home? He has never been baptized, 12 years of age. Not in our parish, was a little bit of a distance away, but I went. And I was graciously welcomed by Paul and upon his mother. And uh, their living room looked like a ER room or an ICU room next door at the hospital. All kinds of equipment, all kinds of IV drips. And Paul was there, and he was not really able to speak. Now, those of you who know me, that's my perfect audience, you know, because I like to talk. And uh, young Paul, as I talked a little bit about Jesus and about the kingdom of heaven, I asked him, do you want to be baptized? And I will never forget the beauty of his smile. It could have lit up the entire Western New York community. And so there in his living room in the bed, I baptized him. I confirmed him. I gave him the tiniest piece of the Eucharist so he received communion. And then within the week, I celebrated his funeral at St. Amelia Church. Hospitality to be welcoming us to someone's home or being invited and asked to perform what appears to be some service for another ultimately transforms and changes our lives. That was the late 1990s. I've never forgotten him. He's changed me.
be hospitable, and do not complain. Number 10, use your gifts to serve one another as a steward of God's grace. Use your gifts to serve one another. I remember one of the confirmation retreats that uh, I celebrated here early on in my time at St. Greg's, and we were talking about the different ministries and asking the teenagers to sign up for one of the ministries as soon as they were confirmed. And I remember one of the teenagers in my small group really wasn't saying anything, that conversation, and so I asked him directly, I said, well, what is it that you would like to, to do? You know, perhaps teach religious education or be a lector or Eucharistic minister, or some, some, a leadership role in youth ministry. And he said, well, I really don't have time for any of that. And I said, well, when is it that you would expect to find the time to begin to serve the Lord and contribute to the parish? He said, well, I think that will happen when I retire. True story, when I retire. And I said, well, I encourage you to do it before that for a few reasons. One, it'll change your life, and two, we're not sure that you'll live long enough to retire. We do not know how long we'll live. And so we use our gifts, our talents, each and every day to serve other. Number 11, and this is the gospel in a summary fashion, act with the right intention. Don't love those who just love you in return. What good is there in that? Don't lend to those who you know are going to repay you. What good is there in that? We're to act with the right intention in the name of Christ, to love, to serve, to forgive, without expecting anything in return. And number 12, and this comes really from the gospel in between the lines, remember that you do not have any enemies personally. You can't really have another person be an enemy. The only real enemy is evil itself and choosing a life of sin, which brings evil into the world. That is the real enemy that we must all combat. So for our dear graduates, for all of us present here, what is it that the Lord requires of you? The Lord requires all of these 12 things in particular, and why? Why is it so important to see that the Lord requires this each and every day? Well, first of all, our eternal salvation depends on it. That's why Jesus, of course, died for our salvation, but it also requires us to realize that just because we were baptized isn't enough. We must faithfully live our baptism. And you must faithfully live your baptism each and every day of your life in word and in action. And another part of the why we are to live these 12 ways of what the Lord requires, because the church on earth needs it. The Diocese of Buffalo right now needs it. St. Gregory the Great, school and parish, depends on it. So often we have seen in the news over the last couple weeks churches and schools closing. And why? Why is that happening? There's many reasons and many factors, but one is because so many of the baptized have simply played church rather than actually living their baptism as the church. Sometimes we pretend simply to be Catholic, but we really don't speak and act in way, shape, or form to show that we are. And so the church, the diocese, this parish needs each one of us to not play church, pretend, but rather to actually live our baptism. It begins at Sunday Mass, continues on in our words and actions, if it be at school, if it be where we work, if it be in our neighborhood, if it be where we play sports. I'd like to conclude with a couple quotes. First, there are the sort of things we are told in polite society to not bring up. 
You know the difficult and unpleasant things. But if we're going to be men and women for this time in history, we need to stop pretending that the, quote, church of nice is a winning proposition. We must always speak and act in charity, but never mistake charity for cowardice. Our Catholic faith has always been countercultural. Our Lord, along with the countless followers, were all put to death for their adherence to her teaching. The world around us says that we should keep our beliefs to ourselves. We fear speaking truth because now, unfortunately, truth is in the minority. Words maybe to reflect on as we go forward from church today. I think those words, if you have paid attention to the media, should have some uh, importance to you. They're words of Harrison Butker from his commencement speech that became quite the topic of conversation in social media. Second quote, one that we've heard in school this past week, last week at Mass, comes from Micah Price. Micah Price, a senior who was graduating from Campbell County High School in Kentucky, and as Mr. Luckett remind us, another proud Kentuckian. I said that right, Kentuckian, right? All right, I passed. Micah Price spoke these words in the commencement speech. Quote, Class, before another word leaves my mouth, I must give the honor and the praise and the glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the light. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Class, and everyone in the audience today, I'm here to tell you that if you don't have any of those things in your life, you can't seem to find the answer. My Lord and Savior is the answer. He will give you the truth, the way, and the life. Those words, when he paused, brought thunderous applause. He was also denied his diploma by the superintendent of schools, Shelley Wilson. Eventually, he received it at a later date. This is the world in which we live. And for our graduates, we're sending you hopefully well-equipped to have the courage of a Micah Price, to have the courage of a, a Harrison Butker, Butker, to have the courage to really live the faith. We love you. We're proud of you. We congratulate you. Today, we're sending you out. We're sending you out to, to high school and later to college. And still later, you're going to be sent to take the Lord Jesus Christ to the operating room, to the courtroom, to the Senate chamber, to the assembly, to the boardroom, and maybe to some professional athletic fields. Most importantly, you take with you your faith in Jesus Christ, not in a cowardly way, but with conviction of the truth. And as you do so, you do so to live faithfully your vocation as a generous and chaste single man or woman, as one faithfully committed in the commitment to bond of love and marriage. And someday we pray and hope for at least one of you gentlemen to be ordained a priest, as the church needs priests. And for at least one of you young men and young ladies graduating to consider and become a religious sister or brother. As you go forward, what is the Lord asking of you? The Lord is demanding of you to be like a Harrison, to be like a Micah, to be like a Carlo Acutis, who you know well about, his statue in the corner. These individuals lived Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. We pray, hope, and believe. And I know you have all that you need to do the same.